step one You say you need to talk He walks You say sit down, it's just a talk He smiles politely back at you You step politely Privilege to be involved in an event like this with everything that's happening in, in Durham today and speaking as a person in recovery myself I think spirituality is really an action word and um, that's, that's what we're seeing um, in Durham this weekend. Um, but what I'm here for at this, this very precise moment is to, um, to share with you some of the findings of, of our research project, the Higher Power Project, um, whose main focus um, is on uh, the, the language of higher power in 12-step recovery. Um, and um, Anne-Marie, if I could have the first slide. Um, I think it's fair to say that the territory we're entering, as we know, attracts very strong opinions. And there'll be people in this room who believe that the only reliable route out of addiction is a belief in God or a higher power. And there may be others in the room who believe that such views are incoherent and that people who hold those views are deluded. The Higher Power Project is committed to neither of those opinions, and it's not about critiquing anyone's beliefs. We observe that sincerely held beliefs in this area emerge from devastating personal struggle with addiction and hard-won recovery. And a basic principle for the research is the acknowledgement of the authority of the individual's own experience and their own description of their recovery. And we also acknowledge that recovery crops up all over the place, both outside and inside of mutual aid, and accompanied by all sorts of beliefs and none. Um, so I'm interested in, in the kind of spirituality in, inside the 12-step fellowships, but I'm also interested in the wider recovery spirituality of which you know, this, this event is an example. So my background and training is in religious studies. Um, although I've briefly worked in a treatment centre, I'm not an expert in treatment or clinical practice. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not any kind of scientist. I'm not promoting any treatment methodology, and I'm not making any claims about efficacy. I'm not qualified to. What I am qualified to do, technically, I suppose, is um, empowering university students who are studying a wide range of the world's religious traditions and spiritualities to go beyond prejudices, stereotypes, unconscious biases and theories in order to see clearly. In the Higher Power Project, I'm simply attempting to do that with 12-step spirituality. And in doing that, I hope the findings might be useful um, to challenge some of the sweeping statements about 12-step spirituality which circulate in some quarters and in some literature. There are discerning professionals and people seeking recovery who, for genuine and conscientious reasons, are alarmed by what appears to be a recommendation to take up a particular metaphysical belief. But unfortunately, a lot of the sweeping statements that are made by those who are antagonistic to it, they're made for ideological reasons or because people have another um, recovery product to sell and 12-step is free. Another reason, I think, is, is just simple ignorance. Ed Day, who's, who's a researcher from King's College London, has shown that around 60% of substance misuse workers have never even been to a 12-step meeting. This, of course, can change. Now, I want, in the next five minutes or so, to use a, a, a bit of the type of critical thinking that we do in religious studies to problematise some of the sweeping statements that you find. You know the ones I mean. Um, Twelve step, they're the God Squad. Bible and big book bashers, they make you get on your knees, that, that kind of thing. Um, the kind of sweeping statements that's behind sensationalist titles like this one. In religious studies, my discipline, there are several key mistakes that we try to avoid when we study a religious tradition or a form of spirituality. And I'll mention three of those. I could have the next slide. So firstly, we avoid assuming that everything that can be known about a tradition can be learned from its scriptures. We certainly see scriptures as one form of data, 
but we're critical about how they're used. Of course, there are Christians and Muslims and members of fellowship who will say everything you need to know is in the book. But if we're proper scholars, we'll be interested in precisely how the book is used, which bits are quoted, which bits do people keep quiet about, which bits do they argue over, how are passages interpreted by different communities, in different cultures, at different points in history, who actually reads the scriptures, what are the power dynamics around interpretation? How does a particular interpretation become authoritative? The way that a text relates to a community is highly complex and it changes. Rather than quoting what the founders of AA thought, mostly Christian, fairly well-to-do men in 1930s America, it's important, I think, to study what the ideas mean to people now, here, in the UK, to women, to young people, to the less well-to-do, to those who can't read, to people of other religions, to people of no religion. A second error we try to avoid in religious studies is the idea that the earliest version of the tradition is the correct version, and developments are really deviations. If that was so, Christians should be circumcised, observe Jewish festivals and abandon their families, because that's, what's ha that's what happened in the beginning. The reality is that religious and spiritual traditions are dynamic, complex, ever-changing cultural forms, interacting with society through history. A large proportion of the literature critical of 12-step mutual aid highlights its religious roots, which is assuming that the, the earliest version is the orthodoxy, and its texts, assuming that the text equals the tradition, and completely ignores the real human beings involved. It fails entirely to engage with the wide diversity of experiences and beliefs of ordinary people who make up the fellowships. It fails to see them as a dynamic, interpretative community, bringing their own critique to the texts on offer, coming to their own negotiated accommodations with the key ideas. The Higher Power Project seeks to overcome that problem by hearing the voices of the people involved speak about their experiences in the here and now, rather than telling them from on high what their book said or what their founders believed. A third error that we try to avoid in religious studies is seeing traditions through the lenses of our own biases. To see secular as normal, as it is surprisingly easy for many of us to do, is not only a particular bias, it's far from accurate. Most of the large British surveys suggest that more than half the population describes themselves as belonging to a religion, even if they don't believe in all of its teachings. What's more, most of these surveys claim that around 70% of the population even if they say they're not religious, are open to the idea of something beyond the material world. In the last couple of decades, sociologists of religion have been falling over themselves to revise and qualify their secularisation theses. Church attendance is without doubt declining significantly, but the rumours of the death and relig of religion and spirituality have been greatly exaggerated. The Higher Power Project has generated a rather interesting statistic related to this. We have data from more than 100 members of anonymous fellowships, and less than 25% of the people that we've spoken to say that they belong to a religion. This is significantly lower than the figure in the, the 2011 census, which states that 59% of the population of England and Wales say that they're Christians and a further 5% say they're Muslims. So when people say that the fellowships are religious organisations, they need to be aware that on our evidence at least, they are at least significantly less religious than the population as a whole. So if not many members describe themselves as religious, what do they say about their beliefs in God or a higher power? Now, I've only got a few minutes for the headlines, but. If I can just have the slide where uh, I give you a, a kind of outline of who we've asked, who we've spoken to. I hope you can see that. 
Um, but obviously most people, the majority of the participants in the project belong to um, Alcoholics Anonymous, but there's, there's a su significant group from Narcotics Anonymous and a number of other um, anonymous fellowships, including things like Al-Anon and Families Anonymous. And the amount there, if you've done the maths, it adds up to more than 100, because of course many people belong to more than one fellowship um, at the same time. So, I've, as I've said, most don't describe themselves as religious. The majority favour the term spiritual but not religious, which has got an acronym, SBNR. Um, and amongst the participants that we've spoken to, there are several self-identified atheists and agnostics. So, atheist Keith said that with one or two exceptions, people accept my viewpoint. Many agree with it and, and are more inclined to acknowledge their own lack of religious belief when someone like myself with long-term sobriety, Keith was 35 years sober when we interviewed him, demonstrates that it's possible to combine atheism with the AA programme. I use an adapted version of the 12 steps, which does not mention God. I have two sponsors, one a devout practicing Roman Catholic and the other a high church Anglican. Both of them accept my views and do not love me any the less. I think that, that kind of symbolizes one of, one of the, the most astonishing features of 12-step spirituality. People who have beliefs that in, in other realms of life would be seen as antagonistic beliefs to each other are actually uh, living together effectively in a spirit of sharing, which I think is something um, of enormous value. Numerous participants name their fellowship or their friends in recovery as their higher power and make no recourse at all to metaphysical language. Such participants sometimes say that God is best understood for them as an acronym for a group of drunks or druggies or the good orderly direction of the steps. Some identify their higher power as the awesome power of nature. Some as the spirit of the universe, which is a term used in AA's big book and elsewhere. Some as, and I quote, like the force in Star Wars. Many identify their higher power as the power of love. Amongst participants who use the term God, some are keen to distinguish their understanding of God from anything they've learned in formal religious settings. So this is Ian, and he's talking about God. God, I hated the fucker. All the bad things that had happened to me in my life were his fault, and this being the God I was brought up on, Catholic. I'm pleased to say I've been able to separate God from religion. I was a bit worried about sharing that with you in this, <laughs> in this environment, but I, I mentioned my anxiety um, to the bishop and, and he said, I don't think God would mind. <laughs> so um, it also takes the, the, the form of an inclination to reject a youthful conception of God on the one hand, judging, increasing guilt, which keeps them drinking, or the kind of God who answers prayer in mechanistic ways. Many say they begged God repeatedly to stop them drinking or using, but he never did. The idea of, and I quote, a vending machine God or a Santa God is often referenced negatively. As well as rejecting ideas about God that they see as rooted in religion, some of our participants also reject big book or NA basic text presentations of God insofar as he's described as male, and they prefer feminine or neutral terms. Ben says, I describe God in the feminine because my concept of life giver is purported to the feminine of all species I know of. They also sometimes reject particular slogans or common figures of speech used in and, in and around meetings. One participant, Jennifer, says, I don't consider higher power to be a personal being, anthropomorphic, 
nor an intelligent puppeteer in the sky directing the show. I do not conceive of HP, that's higher power, as a Santa God who re rewards the good and punishes the naughty. Neither do I see this force as working for some and not others, as in there but for the grace of God go I. I, I work on a corridor actually with a lot of quite eminent theologians and I sometimes want to burst out of my office waving my transcripts. <laughs> I, ha I have done that actually. Um, <laughs> But that, you know that that's quite sophisticated theology um, that this this participant is using. Um, statements like this indicate a process of personal reflection, discernment, and negotiation, and not the blind acceptance of propositional statements. Jennifer again, I toss out the personal God language or the maleness, and replace those words with grace or love. Sophia is another participant who doesn't accept authoritative statements but comes to her own autonomous conclusions. She says, the people in the fellowship have had a huge influence over my version of an HP, mainly by me not agreeing, for me, with a lot of HP versions I hear in AA. So by defining what my HP is not, it has helped me define what it is. The majority of our participants have mentioned other literature or media influential in their development of a concept of a higher power. Some, next one, please. Um, some of this might be described as religious and some as secular. Whilst the fellowships have recommended readings, there's no evidence in our research that members are constrained in their search for inspiration, or that there is a particular religious or Christian agenda at work. Even this small taste of some of the data suggests that the experience of and the language used by contemporary members of 12-step mutual aid is diverse and personal. Members claim agency to define their own terms over against the authority of traditional religion and over against the authority of recognised fellowship texts. They read those texts, but they read them with a filter. There's also evidence that they adopt the ritual language of the fellowships, but critically and selectively so. In fact, although less officially religious than religious, people who attend NA and AA meetings are not that different from the population at large in terms of their beliefs. A significant minority have recognisably Christian beliefs about God. A significant minority are atheists. The vast majority have no religious affiliation. Some of these are deist. Some of, the, some of them believe in a benevolent force of some kind. Some believe in the power of friendship or of the personal experience of recovery and some a combination of all of these. Of course, almost all the participants in the project so far have claimed a higher power was necessary for their recovery. The 12-step model starts with a recognition around powerlessness, around a substance or a behaviour. But for a great many people, that higher power meant nothing metaphysical or theological, just simply that they could not do it alone. There's a word, a term emerging in the literature to describe this that I think is very useful for people who are trying to understand what happens in 12-step in spirituality, and that term is horizontal transcendence. Um, so we often think of transcendence as, you know, transcendent is, is God above and beyond, but there's a kind of spirituality in, in the 12-step movement and the wider recovery movement too that is about horizontal transcendence, just means the, the power that comes from connectedness, from, from having a common purpose. Members commonly attribute their recovery not to themselves but to their higher power. To interested professionals, that can ring alarm bells because it appears to invoke religion. But the weight of the evidence suggests that the path of traditional religion is only one path amongst many that people forge for themselves 
within contemporary 12-step mutual aid, and the overriding picture is one of individual autonomy and personal journey. That's it. Thank you. Okay.